नमो to the glass and uh, he said the glass is already broken just keep um, telling yourself glass is already broken and remind yourself continually the glass is already broken even if it's still a glass and you can use it as a glass um, when you know that a glass is already broken um, then you um, can use the glass wisely and without attachment. I used to tell the story of uh, Sangharaja went on a trip to China, he was given beautiful um, <clears throat> tea set, and uh, he was um, informed that it was a very expensive, very precious. Uh, tea set, and uh, on his return to Bangkok, um, he felt quite a lot of um, tension around this teapot um, tea set. Always afraid that the teapot uh, might break. Um, he had upataks and monks and novices looking after him. He's constant. He's constantly aware of this kind of underlying fear, and tension that the teapot would be broken, it would be dropped by a clumsy novice, a clumsy monk. And then finally, one day, it actually happened. And the teapot was dropped, this very precious, beautiful, antique teapot, fell to the ground, smashed. And the Sangharaja said, Oh, thank goodness for that. And now I can get that off my get that off my mind. Um, it's the accumulation of, of pressure and uh, worry about the teapot not breaking outweighed the pleasure um, of using it. The um, the way of uh, reflecting that Chen Cha taught us uh, was that the the teapot's already broken. And uh, so we, the the ideal um, of the the samana is one who is say he's dead before he's dead, and say he's dead to the world, um, <clears throat> dead to the passions um, of the world, but he's not a, a dried up old stick. Um, but his his death to the things of the world is a is a, an awakening um, to the things of the spirit. The um, <clears throat> there can only be um, a new life uh, where there is a willingness to go through um, a death um, of old things, and and every religion has. Um, stories and myths and symbols um, to represent this this truth um, there has to be a sloughing away of the old skin um, there must be a willingness to put down um, the old and the worn and um, there is a parable or story told by uh, the Buddha of the, the two friends uh, walking along and finding various materials by the side of the road, and then the one, the one man who uh, puts down at each um, <clears throat> each time that they come to um, something 
uh, along the side of the road, which is worth more than um, what they're carrying. And they put down what they're carrying and pick up um, the new the new thing, which is of, of more value. Whereas um, the second person, um, he's not sure. And the first time he comes across something which is more valuable, he uh, he's not sure. Maybe it's a trick. Maybe um, you know it's not a sure thing. So he keeps um, he keeps his original load. Um, now, having rejected the first alternative, he finds it psychologically more difficult to um, abandon um, his his first load uh, for the second uh, more valuable item because it would be an admission that he made a mistake just now and um, or perhaps he has some other reason um, but the longer he keeps with his original load the more difficult it is to put it down and um, <clears throat> and we see uh, don't we that um, so often we, we have particular habits uh, particular loads that we carry around uh, and um, although one part of us um, feels the heaviness and feels the pain um, and there is something um, more valuable um, available to us and yet somehow we fear uh, we fear that uh, moment when we've put down the old and not yet taken up the new uh, when we've died to the familiar um, and yet not yet integrated the unfamiliar and not really sure what it's going to be like uh, perhaps we uh, you know in, in English we say better the devil you know you know there's a uh, feeling that bad as this is I, I know just how bad it is and I know how to cope with it um, and somehow that um, <clears throat> seems a, a better alternative um, than taking up something which may well be um, better less painful or not painful at all but which you can't control or you don't know the full extent of it you don't know what it'll do to your feeling of who you are and um, the, uh, the illusion, the, the picture of ourselves that we carry around and the ideas of ourselves that we have and the whole kind of complex of mental states which we, we sometimes refer to as ego or, or whatever, um, the most um, characteristic feature of this whole constellation is, is a sense of familiarity Mm -hmm. that that's our, our refuge in the, in the familiar that um, bad as it is it's familiar we know it um, it's been around long enough and um, <coughs> this is uh, in the story of uh, uh, Beowulf you remember the, um, the, this uh, retelling of the Beowulf story um, a very old Anglo-Saxon myth of the monster who who um, kills all the um, all the Anglo-Saxon um, uh, villages and and um, until finally a great hero comes forth, Beowulf, who slays the dragon, slays the slays Grendel, the uh, awful creature. It's an um, excellent retelling of this um, story um, <clears throat> years ago um, in which the, the author, American author, rewrote the story from the point of view of the creature. And uh, in this, this retelling of the Beowulf um, myth, um, he comes over as a kind of bodhisattva um, who sees um, these gross, crude human beings um, doing nothing except um, drinking and partying and fighting and uh, eating and having sex and leading a totally um, sort of crude, gross kind of life. And he realizes the only thing that's going to civilize them um, is fear of death. Um, so he starts uh, in a very compassionate kind of way, creeping in and eating a few of them and um, <clears throat> instilling this uh, kind of fear 
the recognition that the, the glass is already broken, um, that uh, life's not something that you can take for granted. And um, it's, uh, it's a very uh, interesting take on this, on this whole, whole myth. So we're, so we're trying to keep reminding ourselves of um, these truths and, and our life verse is not, you know, it's not a um, whodunit story or a, um, um, a, a cheap novel that you, know, you read once and throw away and there's teachings, are, um, things that you have to read and reflect on again and again and again and again and again and let them uh, gradually, gradually sink in um, you know, and, uh, and reminding ourselves that we don't know, we know about, you know, we know, we know about the Four Noble Truths and we know about um, the Three Characteristics, we, know, we probably know quite a lot about them um, but uh, if we can't yet let go of uh, greed and hatred and illusion, we don't actually know what those terms mean. Um, and this is a, um, a humbling reflection, but a useful one to remember that um, what are the Four Noble Truths, what are the Eightfold Paths, what are the Seven Bojangas, and yeah, I know all that. Yeah, we know about them, we know their names. Um, uh, but have we actually penetrated them, and do we really know? Um, and it's when we uh, when we realise that we don't really know that um, there's a way ahead. You know, Buddha says the the fool who knows that he's a he's a fool is is wise, and at least that. Um, at least um, I think we probably the fact that we're we're choosing to spend our lives in this way is we've we've uh, we've transcended the state of the fool. Um, but this uh, recognition um, of how much more there is that needs to be done um, and, and not um, assuming that we, we have known things that we, we've really learnt about. Um, and learning about things is extremely important and uh, not something to be denigrated uh, but also not to be given uh, too much importance. So the, the real uh, test um, of whether you know something um, is whether you can let go of it. Um, the test of uh, whether <coughs> you know, something is really yours is if you can give it away. In a way, test of um, your, your, your practice and your um, understanding of Dhamma is your, your willingness to... Um, let go, and your willingness to, to die, and to die every day, and to die from, from the old and the tired and, the, and that which is just going round and round and round and round, and, and to break through into, into what is new. And, um, a number of similes um, in the suttas um, of chicks in, in eggs um, the Buddha's asked, "What's the difference between you know, the um, the Buddha and the Arahants?" And he says, "It's like there are a lot of eggs, and and he was the fir- he's the first chick to break out. Um, he's he's you know he's he's not um, raising himself up. His enlightenment um, as anything in any way in qualitative way is different from the the Arahants." Um, Except that he was the first; he's the he's the elder brother. But the, of those various um, similes of chicks and, and hatching out that appear, um, it's it's good, I think, to just reflect on. Have you ever imagine what you'd be like uh, as a chick? You know, conscious, and and you know, in a encased in an egg, uh, and you know, there's warmth coming from outside, but it's not like you know, being a human being and just sort of pushed out, you know, you have to do the work yourself. You're not inside the, the mother anymore. And, you know, there must be fear, there mustn't there. You know, you say, well, that's all you've ever known. What's outside the shell? You know, it's frightening. Um, but if you're going to live, you have to, sooner or later, you just have to push your claws out through the, um, through the eggshell. You find the eggshell, which is your whole world and seems such a, 
in, probably for chicks, they probably think that shell is about a foot thick, you know, and, and then actually push their claws through it. I mean, there's it's, it's nothing more than that. And and that and I feel that that shell, that, you know, the, we've surrounded ourselves in shell of ignorance and tanha, um, which seems so thick, doesn't it? And I, and I think that you push your way through it, and it's just that. I mean, it's like an eggshell. It's that fragile. Um, once you can arouse that kind of that kind of energy, you've got the faith that's willing to say, "I'm just going to go for it," you know, even if I'm afraid. And this is the um, the quality of the the truly brave person. You see any um, the the testaments of those who've been in, in the most awful um, kind of uh, conditions and in in wartime and. There's, there's a definite distinction to be made between um, the foolhardy person uh, who just kind of uh, goes into a kind of a trance and just loses it completely reckless and, and jumps out of the trench and, and runs forward and attacks the enemy and maybe um, over, overcomes a great number of um, enemy soldiers and is successful. That's, um, that's not really bravery. Um, the really brave people are those who feel fear, are fully awake to fear, um, but they do what needs to be done anyway. Mm. And in a, in a battlefield, those are those are the true heroes, not not someone who can just kind of hypnotize themselves to do something, uh, or shut their minds down and go onto automatic pilot. Um, <clears throat> but it's someone who's fully fully aware of the consequences of the um, of the context of the big picture and experiences of fear but is able even though uh, he or she feels fear does what needs to be done and doesn't demand any guarantees because knows that there aren't any and we don't have any guarantees at all except that the, the the glass is going to break. It's going to break because it's broken already. It's of, it's of that, um, it's of that nature. This body um, is broken already. It is of the nature to break up. Um, <clears throat> there's no question about that. Um, this is a time-bound body, and it's something, and it is by its nature, um, dukkha, both in the sense dukkha in the sense of the three characteristics and dukkha in the sense of four noble truths. And the dukkha in the that first sense means that it's inherently instable, unstable. It's, it's unable to maintain itself in any one state um, for any length of time. Um, <coughs> this, this, uh, the Buddha says that all, uh, all sankharas um, are dukkha. Um, and in the uh, in the three characteristics, that that's not um, anything to do with human suffering. Um, this is a this is a statement about the nature of phenomena. It's more like a philosophical statement. So, for instance, if you have a if you have a curry, so an Indian curry, um, you now the, the the finished state of an Indian curry, it's uh, it's hot, um, it smells nice. Um, it's tasty, and so on. That's the that's the state of an Indian curry. But you only have to leave um, that. You don't have to do anything to it. Just leave it there, um, and immediately um, it degenerates from that that condition. It, for instance, it starts to cool down. Um, so one of the causes and conditions, one of the uh, one of the constituents of that Indian curry is its um, its warmth. Uh, the warmth is is unsustainable unless it's being um, being stimulated. You've got a you've got a flame underneath it. If you've got an external stimulus, you, you can maintain the heat of it. You take the heat away, um, and the the heat degenerates. Um, if you leave it uh, longer, then the the smell starts to go, and perhaps the ingredients um, it starts to congeal, or it starts to get, even starts to smell bad. Um, it starts to go off. Um, so this this is a, a profound truth about phenomena. You know, it's both extremely ordinary and obvious. But when you give a thought to it, 
everything, uh, you don't actually have to do anything to destroy it or to provoke some degeneration. You just leave it. Um, and without that input, um, the moment you cut off input, the sustaining input, um, then degeneration sets in. Now this is the this is the way that everything in the universe is, whether a Buddha is born into the world or not. Um, but how it affects you, um, how it affects your body, how it affects your mind, um, this is this is the dukkha in the in the four noble truths. Um, if you're ignorant, if you have craving and attachment in your mind, uh, the dukkha state of things uh, will create um, a sense of um, inner pain and turmoil, which we call uh, dukkha, like human dukkha, dukkha in the Four Noble Truths. Um, so the dukkha of the uh, of sankharas in general, um, this is not something that you can do anything about. Uh, dukkha of physical body, in the sense that the physical body um, is doomed to uh, is to degenerate. Um, its nature is to get old, to get sick, to die. Mm. Um, this is the the dukkha nature of the physical body, um, but the um, but the the dukkha in the four noble truths is not inevitable, because when we know how things are, and we're at peace uh, with the way things are, and we're not um, trying to um, shut off or or ourselves to the way things are, we're not putting our heads in the sand like ostriches. We're not just trying to distract ourselves um, with sensual pleasures. Um, then we have a way to eliminate the dukkha and the four noble truths. You see, all the so many of the um, the things that, as monks, we renounce. Um, if if we were to put them into a single category, um, we could say um, we renounce distractions. So whether it's um, renunciation of of, um, uh, of careers and money and families and and sports and and enjoyments and um, basically where the aim is to free ourselves uh, to renounce or to die to all that which is a distraction from the human condition. Um, so so we're warriors in in the sense that we're. We're willing to be in that battleground and just to be totally there and naked with what it means to be a human being. And this is our, our basic abiding interest to, to penetrate um, our human nature, what it means. Um, not willing just to shut down and to distract ourselves from this, from this, this truth of our lives. Um, so there, there has to be that probing um, interest and inquiry um, into our existence uh, to sustain the, um, this practice. The moment we lose that interest, um, we, know, we, we, we lose that inquiring mind, as it were, and then we can stagnate in practice and we look for a little niche and we look for a little, little quiet little place or somewhere where we can rest and be quiet. Um, and to shut down in one way or another. So, as a summoner, we, we renounce um, the, this option, the easy option of just shutting down and just being carried along um, with the easy way, with the world. We, this is not the easy way. Uh, this is not the, the big vehicle, it's the small vehicle. It's not the easy way, it's the hard way. Um, and it's, the, it's a small vehicle because very few people um, are willing to devote themselves to, to practicing this way. Um, it's not because it's not welcoming um, to all. It welcomes everyone. But there are few people who are willing to take it on and make the kind of sacrifices. Um, but if you're, if you're willing to give up the, um, the need, the desire, the hope for guarantees, um, and if you have that kind of faith based on observation um, of your own life, um, then you can really make progress. Um, 
as you practice over, over a number of years, uh, your samadhi practice and, and so on may, may uh, go up and down. But if you look beyond that, you'll see certain things which, um, which solidify, become stronger and more and more uh, firm and clear to you year by year without any doubt. And I would say um, of, these, of these things, the, the, um, the central one is this belief in kamma. You notice that in yourself. And you notice how, um, after a while, you just get this absolute certainty in a mind that you can't get away with anything. You notice know, that? You can't get away with a single thing. Um, every single uh, defiled action, every single defiled word, every single defiled thought, um, it has a result. You, you can never get away with it. Uh, and at, this, and at the same time, nothing is lost. Every single good, kind, wholesome action, every single word, every single smile, every single gesture, um, every single wholesome thought, it has a result. It's not lost. Nothing is ever lost. It's, it's just, it means the whole, the whole universe in which you live, every single moment of your life um, has meaning because it has consequence. Everything has a consequence, that, that's the meaning. Um, and, and it's this um, meaningful uh, nature of existence um, is one in which you can participate and can affect um, in a skillful and wise way. Um, notice from yourself, from your own practice, just how um, qualities of mind, habits, new habits um, emerge and you can't quite see exactly how it happened. And mostly then they're, they're good habits, but every now and again you see an old habit. And I'm talking about habits is something unexpected happens. And there is a spontaneous response. You know, without thinking, um, you respond in a particular way. That's where you see the results of the kamma you've created, in that kind of unthinking, spontaneous response to a situation. Um, you, see, uh, you see someone in pain, and immediately um, there's a desire to, to help them. So suddenly, um, at odd times, without, without reflection, there's just this wish to make others happy. There's this interest in the truth of things, the way things are. Um, things which you, you know, if they would have happened um, two years ago, five years ago, um, or, or whatever, would have filled you with anxiety and foreboding. And now you just realize, without quite knowing how it is, that you just don't see that there. It's just, it's just not arising anymore. And you see that, that nothing's lost. Um, if you act in, a, in an indulgent way, you think, well, I, I, you know, I, I try so hard in all these other areas, I should just could have, um, it's all right just to um, be a bit easy in this area, considering how much I do in all these other areas which are difficult for me. You sort of just sort of have a kind of a, a pet chelaser um, to just keep, 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 keep with you, you know, just for old time's sake. Well, you can't get away with it um, because over the course of time and it's, it, it starts to have um, adverse effects on your life. If you, the good things that you do, even if you think, yeah, it's, just, it's kind of not very much, it's nothing very special, I'm, you know, um, and you don't really even think it's very um, meaningful at all. But these things blossom, grow in your mind. And you see something after a few years and you say, where does that come from? It's come from tiny little bricks, tiny little, tiny little actions, tiny little um, conscious dying to um, indulgence, distractions. A strength is born and integrity and nobility of mind is built up little by little by little 
very, very few of us, I think, just have these startling kind of blinding insights and, and suddenly everything's, everything's changed that wasn't as it used to be. I mean, maybe it happens, um, but it's not the, the kind of the model for our, our spiritual development. Um, it's for, uh, I think, for a majority of people, it's just... Um, if we can, with our, in our meditation, if we have that kind of humility um, and humble heart, just to be with one single in-breath, mm. not thinking about sitting for three hours or five hours or jhana or this, just to be completely present uh, and content and happy and bright and clear and aware with one single breath and then start again another single breath this is this is this is kamma this is the development of this is the abandonment of evil development of the wholesome the purification of the mind right there um, in that pure intention to be totally with your experience for one in breath and one out breath and then to to adapt it to your life as well with every single situation with every um, whether it's something that brings up feelings of liking or disliking or, um, or whatever the kind of the, the commentary is um, but to have that kind of total respect and total um, contentment and being to do, to do this to do, to, I think Suzuki Roshi says to burn yourself up um, in whatever you do this is not the burning of the Aditya Pariyaya Sutra it means just giving yourself totally even the most mandane tasks. Um, if it's washing your bowl or cleaning your teeth or um, sweeping your path or whatever, just to be that capacity to give yourself totally um, to that. Um, and this is um, this, this intention to do that arising again and again. It creates new channels in the mind. It allows the energy of the mind to um, to flow in, in channels leading to peace and there's all, there's similarly so the Buddha, everything kind of inclining towards the sea like all the streams flowing to the sea and so you, you're, you're, you're trying to develop that now all the streams of thought and perception um, leading to the sea of peace uh, rather than to a sort of muddy bog of confusion So when we if we find that sort of putting forth effort um, problematic, then we, we we come down to a very basic unit of effort. Unit of effort is a single breath. A unit of effort is is, is these few minutes. Um, this particular task, this particular job. Um, very very humble, one step at a time, and and we find we can breathe in that, and we can. And, and we have the confidence uh, through um, seeing the results of our actions, the results of our intentions. We're, we're willing to, to let go, willing to, to die, to die before the glass breaks, die before the body breaks up. Um, dying moment by moment, all that which constricts and binds us. Um, this is where our heart becomes more and more free um, and we can really start to um, understand um, the meaning of uh, the Buddha's teaching of liberation. So I'd like to offer these few words to you this evening. <coughs> 